Thank you for holding, and welcome everyone to the Technip FMC third quarter 2023 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you'd like to withdraw your question, again, press star one. Thank you. I will now turn the call over to Matt Seinsheimer, Senior Vice President, Investor Relations and Corporate Development. Mr. Seinsheimer, please go ahead. Thank you, Jack. Good morning and good afternoon, and welcome to Technip FMC's third quarter 2023 earnings conference call. Our news release and financial statements issued earlier today can be found on our website. I'd like to caution you with respect to any forward-looking statements made during this call. Although these forward-looking statements are based on our current expectations, beliefs, and assumptions regarding future developments and business conditions, they are subject to certain risk and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed in or implied by these statements. Known material factors that could cause our actual results to differ from our projected results are described in our most recent 10K, most recent 10Q, and other periodic filings with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. We wish to caution you not to place undue reliance on any forward-looking statements which speak only as of the date hereof. We undertake no obligation to publicly update or revise any of our forward-looking statements after the date they are made, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. I will now turn the call over to Doug Ferdihart, Technip FMC's Chair and Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, Matt. Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for participating in today's earnings call. We delivered solid results in the third quarter. Subsea inbound orders came in strong at $1.8 billion, and adjusted EBITDA improved sequentially for both subsea and surface technologies exceeding the guidance we provided on our second quarter call. This momentum is also driving our expectations for full year results higher. Continuing with total company financial highlights in the quarter, revenue was $2.1 billion. Adjusted EBITDA was $284 million with an adjusted EBITDA margin of 13.8% when excluding foreign exchange impacts. Total company inbound was $2.1 billion. Total company backlog ended the period at $13.2 billion. In subsea, we received significant orders for flexible pipe in the period. These included an award from Petrobras for the pre-salt fields in Brazil, and our largest ever flexibles contract in the Gulf of Mexico for Woodside's try-on project. As both pioneer and market leader of this technology, Flexible Pipe provides us with the unique capability to design fully integrated end-to-end subsea systems for our clients. We have the unique ability to integrate flexible technology into our IEPCI offering, which greatly simplifies field architecture. This enables a further reduction in project cycle time, improving economics, and driving greater differentiation in our integrated offering. Beyond Flexible's activity, we also experienced an exceptionally high level of unannounced project awards in the quarter, which speaks to the ongoing strength of the market. In subsea services, inbound was robust, driven by installation and life of field activities. Given the continued strength in our inbound, we are confident that subsea orders will exceed $9 billion for the full year. And if we extend the view to include our current expectations for 2024, we now believe the next five quarters will approach $11 billion. With this near-term update, we now expect to exceed the guidance 
for $25 billion of subsea inbound through 2025, and we will provide an update on this extended outlook on our fourth quarter earning call. The durability of this cycle is driven by both an expansion in the number of active basins, which has nearly doubled versus the prior cycle, as well as a growing and more diverse customer base. Additionally, this cycle is supported by a robust and strengthening pipeline of feed activity. In the third quarter, feed studies increased nearly 40% when compared to the number of awards in the first half of the year. Importantly, more than half of the studies awarded to our company in 2023 have the potential to be direct awarded upon Project FID. This provides us with extended visibility and confidence that subsea opportunities will remain resilient beyond 2025, even before we consider new frontiers that are likely to present themselves in the second half of the decade. Subsea backlog ended the period at 12.1 billion, a nearly 60% increase year over year. An increasing proportion of this backlog is coming from IEPCI, Subsea 2.0, and other direct awards, reflecting the high quality of our order book. Year to date, we have been awarded the industry's three largest integrated contracts, Equinor's BMC 33 project in Brazil, the Rosebank project in the UK, and Ocker BP's Otsera High project in the North Sea. While integrated execution will certainly shorten cycle times, the size and scope of these awards provide us with multi-year visibility as a significant portion of the project revenues extend beyond 2025. In surface technologies, international activity increased sequentially. We continue to ramp up production in our Saudi Arabia facility as well as successfully execute on our multi-year framework agreement with Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. Activity in North America was moderately lower in the period. However, operating margin improved sequentially, benefiting from the strategic actions previously taken to reduce our cost structure. In closing, our commercial and operational success continues to drive improved financial results, and ELF will discuss how the strength in the second half should drive our full year results higher. Additionally, the upward revisions to our subsea order outlook are fueled by high quality inbound, driven by IEPCI, subsea services, and other direct awards and which are now expected to represent more than 70% of segment orders in the current year. And more importantly, these results are further strengthening the foundation for higher and more sustainable performance in the years ahead. I will now turn the call over to ELF to discuss our financial results. Thanks, Doug. Inbound in the quarter was $2.1 billion, of which $1.8 billion came from subsea. Revenue in the quarter totaled $2.1 billion. EBITDA was $284 million, when excluding foreign exchange loss of $46 million, and impairment, restructuring, and other charges totaling $4 million. Operationally, we delivered solid results. In subsea, revenue was $1.7 billion, up 6% from the second quarter. The increase was driven by mid-single digit revenue growth in both projects and services. The largest drivers of the improvement were in Norway and Brazil. Adjusted EBITDA was $258 million with a margin of 15.1%, up 70 basis points from the second quarter. Results benefited primarily from higher volume and favorable activity mix. In surface technologies, revenue was $349 million. This was a modest decline versus the second quarter, primarily driven by lower revenue in North America, which decreased 8% sequentially, partially offset by higher international activity. Adjusted EBITDA was $50 million, a 6% sequential increase. 
International results benefited from improved operational performance in the Middle East. North America results were largely unchanged versus the prior quarter, despite the revenue decline, benefiting in part from strategic actions taken in prior quarters. Adjusted EBITDA margin was 14.3%, up 100 basis points versus the second quarter. Turning to corporate and other items in the period, corporate expense was 24 million when excluding less than 1 million of charges. Net interest expense was 27 million and tax expense was 19 million. And lastly, we incurred a foreign exchange loss of 46 million in the quarter. Approximately 50% of the loss was directly related to actions taken that we believe will reduce the volatility in our foreign exchange exposure going forward. Importantly, we believe these were one-time elements of our results in the period. Approximately 30% of the FX loss was related to the current cost of hedging our euro-denominated debt and liability positions, with the remaining portion due to unfavorable movements in currencies that we are unable to economically hedge, with the Argentine peso having the biggest impact in the period. Cash flow from operating activities was $222 million and included a $27 million payment related to the previous legal settlement with the French National Prosecutor's Office. Capital expenditures were $44 million. This resulted in free cash flow of $178 million in the quarter. In August, we completed the sale of the Apache II pipeline vessel for net cash proceeds of $54 million. The sale marks another tangible strategic step forward in our commitment to higher and more sustainable financial returns. We end the period with cash and cash equivalents of $691 million. Net debt fell almost $200 million to $650 million. During the quarter, we repurchased 2.7 million shares for $50 million and paid $22 million in dividends. Total shareholder distributions for the period were $72 million. Moving to our guidance, I will first provide an update to our segment expectations for the fourth quarter. For sub-C, we expect the typical seasonal impacts, with revenue declining approximately 10% sequentially and adjusted EBITDA margin coming in at approximately 13%. For surface technologies, we expect revenue to increase about 5% sequentially and adjusted EBITDA margin to be approximately 14%. Turning to the full year, we anticipate corporate expense to come in at the high end of the range of 100 to 110 million. With these updates, we now anticipate the range of outcomes for total company adjusted EBITDA to approximate 915 million for the full year when excluding foreign exchange. This represents a 35 million improvement versus the guidance we provided on our second quarter earnings call. Lastly, we reiterate our free cash flow guidance of 225 to 375 million for the current year. In closing, I will share with you my three key takeaways from the quarter. First, Given the strong Q3 results and improved outlook for Q4, we are increasing our guidance for full year company EBITDA to approximately 915 million when excluding foreign exchange. Second, free cash flow generation improved in the period as expected, keeping us on track to achieve our full year guidance. And third, with the initiation of a dividend in the quarter, and ongoing share repurchase activity, we distributed over $70 million, demonstrating our commitment to return cash to our shareholders. Operator, you may now open the line for questions. Certainly. At this time, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. We ask that you limit yourself to one question and one follow-up to allow everyone an opportunity. David Anderson. At Barclays, your line is open. Great. Thanks. Good morning, Doug. How are you? Very well, David. And yourself? I'm doing great. Um, so a question on maybe just to start on the order outlook. So f- over the next five quarters, you're seeing $11 billion. What looks different about that $11 billion going forward? Or does anything look different in terms of is the customer mix shifting one way or another? I think you said 70%. You're expecting to be sub C 2.0. 
with market capacity tightening, I would think pricing should also be, be, be firming up as well. Could you maybe just kind of talk about the difference going forward with what you, you know, you kind of pulled in over the last year or so? Uh, sure, Dave. Um, I guess at the highest level, the way I would describe it is, you know, it's just a much higher quality inbound. And, you know, there's several aspects to that. Uh, but most importantly for our company is the direct awards, uh, which is now over 70% of our business being direct awarded to us in sub C. That's being driven by our unique IEPCI or integrated offering, our unique uh, sub C architecture, you know, the sub C 2.0, um, and again, our, our very long, strong uh, client relationships. Um, there's also a bit of a mixed shift in terms of the customer base. Um, you know, I, I, I talked about that for a few quarters now. We, we continue to see the customer base expanding um, and, and more people moving into the offshore arena uh, because of the high quality reserves and quite frankly, the access to those reserves. Um, and we have, again, that, that combination of IEPCI and 2.0 and just the open and collaborative way we work with our clients uh, really fits, uh, fits those clients, our, our existing clients, but also the, the new clients uh, in a very favorable way. So I guess I'd really, you know, Dave, what gets us excited is, you know, it's the quality. And we obviously have the opportunity to be selective given the market position that we have. Um, so we can really focus on that, th those high-end, high-quality, inbound, that will create the success for the years to come. So on, on another subject we're starting to hear something about is kind of rising break-even costs for offshore. We, we know rig rates have more than doubled over the past few years. Uh, service costs are moving higher. Just wondering in your, in your conversations with customers, do you get any sense from customers that they're concerned about that? Is that potentially driving a sense of urgency for your customers to get a project locked up before costs move higher? And just kind of related to that question, kind of roughly percentage of an overall project, what percentage do you guys typically comprise? I know they're all different, but just maybe just a range would be helpful. I'm sorry, the second part, what percentage of? Yeah, of your business sort of comprises one of these offshore projects. Just curious, is it, is it 20%, is it 30%? Just gotcha. trying to get a, a better handle on kind of where you fit in the, in the scheme of things. Sure, thank you, Dave. So let me start. Let me do the second part first because I think it'll help feed into the first part. Um, in a brownfield development, so that's in a de development where there's an existing host facility and you're tying back uh, maybe an extended part of the reservoir or a new reservoir back to that host facility. We now, because of being, you know, being the only fully integrated company, we now can represent up to 70% of the cost, Dave of a brownfield development, you know, normally between 60 and 70%. So we, if you will, we are the cost driver. Now I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get off of this cost part here in a second, um, but you know, we do comprise a large portion of the value of that project. In terms of a greenfield development, the rule of thumb is about a third, a third, and a third. That's where the driller has a third, we would have a third, um, and then whoever's building the, uh, the, the floating facility, uh, would, would do the other third. So a little less influence over the overall project economics in a greenfield development, but it still can be quite material. And here's why. And this now falls in, you know, bridges to the first part of your question. It's all about time. It's simply all about time. So yes, you know, I understand rig companies like to talk about day rates, but the reality of the project economics is the best way to influence the overall project returns is to accelerate the time to first oil and most importantly, deliver the project on time. And this is what's driving our customers' behavior, Dave, because they're sitting there and they want to align with the very best companies that give them the highest probability of delivering the project on schedule. And oh, by the way, with Technip FMC, we can typically de deliver it one year ahead of if we don't use Technip FMC. Again, IPCI and 2.0 driving that cost or that cycle time to be much shorter. So that, that's really what we're seeing. We're seeing a flight to quality 
Um, sure, they're, they're always focused on economics and always have been, and so are we. You know, again, as a pure play, we truly understand the value of the offshore, and we truly understand how to drive offshore project economics to an ever higher level. And we do that through our IEPCI, the 2.0 unique offerings to our company, um, which gives us our customers the confidence in our ability to be able to continue to deliver these projects on time. That, that's really the secret sauce of, of our company, Dale. Great. Thanks a lot, Doug. Appreciate it. Luke Lemoyne at Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, Doug. Um, when you laid morning, out Luke. the initial, hey, morning. When you laid out that initial subsea margin target of 15% for 25 in late 21, which you actually just hit this quarter, I don't believe there was much 25 backlog visibility at the time. Um, just kind of guessing, this was somewhat predicated on what you saw coming in the pipeline from 2.0 IPCI direct awards, which you've talked about. You know, since then, you've raised that margin target earlier this year. But my question is, even though you have some backlog visibility past 25, which you show in your slide deck, you know, how comfortable are you with where margins could head over maybe the next three to four years? And um, just to clarify, not looking for a specific margin target, just kind of your confidence and visibility in that three to four year time frame. No problem, Luke. Um, you're spot on. If you go back to November of 2021, it was a very different world. Um, and when you look at what was happening offshore, uh, it was very different indeed. So we were talking about at that point, you know, increasing our margins up to 15%, but largely through the internal initiatives, largely through the internal initiatives. And that's really Subsea 2.0 has allowed us to change our operating model from an engineer to order to a configure to order operating model. That has had profound impact on our business. And you can't just do, you can't, first you have to develop the architecture, but then you have to gain um, enough sc scale um, to be able to really see the benefits of the configure to order. So if you will, it, it's a unique opportunity for our company. So when we gave the 15 per, uh, percent, you know, largely predicated on internal initiatives, clearly the market conditions have improved since 2021, hence raising the 15 percent to 18 percent. Thank you for pointing out we, we tripped the 15 percent already this quarter, um, and we continue to, to be extremely confident in the progression of our ability to be, continue to extend the margins, not only because we're getting ever more benefit from the configure to order model as the IPCI and 2.0 direct awards continues to increase for our company, and we get the volume and the scale benefit um, as well, um, and, and obviously the underlying market conditions are improving for us, um, gives us the confidence to be, and, and it's why we've repeatedly said the 18% is a, is a major milestone on a more ambitious journey. So we remain extremely positive of the future. All right, got it. Uh, thanks so much, Doug. Mark Bianchi at TD Cowan, your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, maybe just quickly, Alf, to confirm on the, the EBITDA for this year, you said 915, not 950, correct? Yes, Mark confirmed. Nine one five is what the, you know. What I said is it's thirty five million up from the prior guide that we had from the prior quarter. Yep. Okay. Super. Thank you. Um, and, and maybe, the, maybe Mark, if I, if I'm, can please. I add something, Mark, just to to clarify also. You know, you may you may wonder. You know, in the prior quarter, if you remember, we we mentioned also that we think we we will be doing EBITDA thirty five, having a thirty five percent growth of EBITDA into twenty twenty four. So now that you take this new number of 915, you can still apply this 35%. So just to be very clear, we haven't backed off on the 35% going into 2024, but I'm happy that you clarified 950 versus 915, but still the, the same dynamics are in place. Okay, that, that's great. That was actually gonna be my next question. Um, Doug, uh, if I remember correctly, you, you came to FTI in the early 2010s, which was a period when I think everybody thought that um, subsea was 
kind of going to grow as far as the eye can see. And it seems like maybe that's where we are shaping up today, but um, the market's quite a bit different. Your offering is obviously very different. But from a customer perspective, um, I'd be curious to hear any reflections on, you know, how things compare today versus um, that early 2010 period. Uh, interesting question, and, and actually, I think a lot about this um, just uh, in my spare time. So, look, a lot has changed. Um, you know, and when we talk about the customers, I would say our customers are much more collaborative, much more open to um, partner-led solutions, much more open to new technologies, um, and it's really what enabled us to be able to achieve the success we've achieved with SubC 2.0. The idea of standardization has been around since before 2010. Uh, the ability to be able to go from engineer to order to configure to order, which is much more than just standardization, was really the key. When we unlocked that and were able to convince our customers that they could still have if you will, optionality, uh, but the building blocks were going to be standardized, not the final, the final product, but the, 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 the input to the final product, product was going to be standardized. That really changed the way of thinking. So look, uh, a lot of the credit goes to our customers um, and, they, and their behaviors, uh, which have certainly changed and improved over the period of time. Our customer base has also expanded quite significantly over that period of time. Then I mentioned in the script, you know, we're, we're operating in twice the number of basins that we have historically operated in. So people don't really think about it that much, but just the offshore market, you know, we think about offshore, you know, as offshore, but it was fairly limited in the areas of offshore that, we, that were really being um, developed, and that has doubled. And then when you start to look in the what keeps this um, momentum going, you start to look at all these frontier basins that we're hearing about. They're not onshore, they're offshore. And they're offshore around the world. They're not in any one particular continent or one particular area. They're spread around the world. And, and those are the, the, you know, those areas are the ones that are going to contribute well beyond the numbers that we're talking about today. Um, so it is very, very different. And thank you for pointing out, I, I do want to close on, you know, we're a different company. We were a great company in 2010. I believe we're an even greater company today. And again, that's driven by the change in our operating model and our ability to be able to demonstrate to our clients and give them the confidence to direct award us the work that they do because of who we are. Great. Thank you very much. Mark Wilson at Jeffries, your line is open. Thank you. Um, yeah, excellent set of results and uh, an outlook there, uh, Doug. Just a, a few outside points. Um, the sale of of the Apache vessel. I'm just wondering if there's any more uh, of those planned. And then the other question: um, Do you see on the horizon a first offshore CCS award coming at all? Those are my two points. Thanks, Mark. Um, you know, regarding the fleet, as we have said since we formed the company uh, on the 17th of January 2017, we were going to focus on a company that really had exemplary through cycle um, returns. And part of that was we were going to do things differently in regards to the fleet. We do not need to own and operate all of the vessels that we use in our business. Uh, the only way to do that is to be a company that others trust and others are willing to work with, um, and that's our reputation, and that's how we've been able to develop our vessel ecosystem and bring in world-class partners like All Seas and Saipam and more in the future. Uh, and that's really what enables us to continue to look at our fleet and determine if those assets are strategic to our company or not. Uh, and if they're not, then we're able to uh, continue to streamline um, our, you know, uh, improve our returns by streamlining our fixed cost base. Okay, very clear. 
I'm sorry, Mark, and I just was reminded of your second question. Uh, I got excited about the first. Thank you. Uh, on the second question, uh, I would answer that by saying, indeed. Kurt Halid at the Benchmark Company. Your line is open. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Morning, Kurt. Oh, great. I just want to make sure I didn't, lo I didn't lose you. Uh, hey, um, hey, Doug. You know, with um, you know, with the expanding inbound and, and backlog you have on on subsea, and, and obviously the increased visibility, you know, out toward the end of the decade. Um, I was wondering if you give us some insights on, you know, what, how, how you're, uh, say, managing execution risk, you know, internally, and, and, you know, what, what you are able to provide to your client base, you know, that assures them that when they do throw this stuff your way, you know, you're going to be in a, a very strong position to handle it, and, and as you said, deliver it on time. Kirk, that's the million-dollar question, and I will tell you when I'm speaking to clients, that is typically, when they call me, that is typically the call. It's, you know, we have this new opportunity. We're looking at this new emerging basin. Uh, we want to be securing assets well into the future. We want, you know, we want to work with Technip FMC. Give, uh, give me or give us the confidence that you're going to be able to deliver this. That is absolutely uh, the discussion that's going on today. First and foremost, do what you say you're going to do. And we've demonstrated that. We continue to shorten the cycle times. We continue to deliver the innovation uh, into the industry. And we continue to be the company that our clients want to partner with, that they want to work with because of our behaviors and who we are as a company. Um, more importantly, as, you know, as, to give them the additional confidence, I should say, is really helping them understand how this shift from engineer to order to configure to order has fundamentally changed the operating model of our company. And we actually had an opportunity earlier this week with our board of directors to kind of walk them through how we're operating the company today um, at a, you know, um, on a daily basis at an operating level. And it, it's a profound change. And the visibility and the um, our ability to be, to, to, to be able to see though, and understand what are those key success factors that will ultimately deliver the KPIs, or if you will, the project on time, and tracking those key success factors is a really quite a fundamental change. And I know it sounds basic, um, but when you're doing configure to order, the only really metric you have, I'm sorry, when you're doing engineer to order, excuse me, the only real metric you have is the output. Did you or did you not deliver on time? And that's too late to fix anything. Um, what they now see is that we have the ability in the configure to order to be well ahead. There's so many things we can do that we could not do in the past because remember, when we got a sub C order, we spent nine months of detailed engineering before we could place a single order with the supply chain, internal or external. The situation our competitors are in today Whereas we're able to work with our clients, and we can look at five years ahead of time, we can look at one year ahead of time, and we can start putting in place those building blocks that are going to enable the success by ensuring that the schedule, by, by having schedule certainty and schedule assurance for our customers. So it really is a different way of operating. And, you know, we'll walk our clients through that, and they see it in all of our operating locations. They're able to experience that in our operating locations. Um, and just continue to deliver at a very, very high level. That's, that's great, color. And, and follow-up, you know, kind of curious, right? We've, we've seen some recent um, kind of tying everything together here, right? You know, with respect to the order book you have coming, the, the insights as to the projects that are, are, are slated for even later this decade and the incremental oil that's going to bring to the market, right? Yet uh, OPEC come out and suggest, you know, continued oil demand growth out beyond 2030. Obviously, you've had the IEA kind of pitch a different tone. But, you know, through all your, your experience in, in dealing with different cycles, right, at the end of the day, I can't imagine a customer moving forward with a project that's going to deliver first oil in the latter part of the decade if, if they're um, – 
data is telling them that uh, the market's not going to be there for the product. But I, I'm just kind of curious as to, you know, when you try to piece all this stuff together, how you sort through the noise. Uh, Kurt, I think, you know, you look for the high quality data, you look for, you listen to your clients, and you look for the most realistic outcome that's not influenced by external factors. And I think it's very, very clear uh, that there's going to be a continued demand and a continued high level of demand. Um, and I, you know, just using the references that you used at the beginning, uh, we certainly believe uh, in the data and the commentary that's being provided by OPEG. Appreciate it, Doug. Thank you. Arun Jaira at JP Morgan. Your line is open. Good morning, Doug. I wanted to get um, some thoughts on the Flexibles business at, at FTI. Uh, I was wondering if you give us a sense of you know how much of your you know kind of current contribution is from Flexibles, and as we think about a couple of the, the large project awards that you announced this, this quarter uh, with Petrobras um, and with Woodside and Gulf of Mexico, how that mix you know could change and, and uh, m maybe the margin profile um, as well, um, as well as maybe just the technology that you think you bring to the table versus two of your other peers that are in that segment. Uh, sure, Arun. You know, as you pointed out, there's you know very few of us who who work in this domain. Um, we're the pioneer, we're the market leader. I would say we focus more on the higher end range of the flexibles. You know, we've always gone. We're the ones who have dri driven diameter. We're the ones who have driven pressure rating. We're the ones who have driven tensile strength, et cetera. Um, and you know, as far as percentage of the business it's it's important um, but more so than the percentage of the business that it represents and you know, I, you know it depends if you prefer boyu base or, or gumbo uh, but anybody who has a boyu base or a gumbo recipe has a secret ingredient uh, this is our secret ingredient this is what makes IEPCI tasteful and uh, the reality of the situation is without this uh, you can only do limited, there's only limited benefit to an integrated offering. This is why as the first mover, we chose to uh, go with Technip at the time. Uh, the flexible offering from CoFlex Eve was absolutely critical to our vision of an optimized subsea architecture. So it's not only the value it brings as a product line, but we're the only ones who have the product within an integrated company. The real benefit we get is the influence it has on our IEPCI awards and also on our IEPCI margins. That's helpful. Um, maybe just a, a follow-up for Alf is um, you mentioned how um, the call it soft guide on, on 2024 is 35% is EBITDA growth from, from the 915. Um, I wanted to, to maybe ask, ask a, for a little bit of a clarification on the cash return. I believe the stated policy is to return 60% of your your free cash flow back. And one of the questions from investors is, how does the FN PNF settlement? How does that impact um, you know the free cash flow calculation and, and cash return? No, no. Thank you for the question. So, so first of all, uh, you know, very clear. We we do have a commitment out there that we will return at least 60% of uh, our free cash flow t to shareholders, and we're going to stay true to that. You know, over the next three years. So, what we further uh, are are saying is that really also um, the the growth rate of 35% that you you see in EBITDA from 23 to 24, we expect to apply that to distributions as well for 2024. So in short, answering your question, yes, there is an impact of roughly $170 million of payments outflow next year uh, in terms of the free cash flow. Uh, but overall, we still expect to drive to, to increase uh, uh, shareholder distributions by 35% uh, in, in line with our EBITDA guidance. So that also tells you something about the underlying strong fundamental cash flow 
that you're going to see year over year if you exclude the, the impact of these 170 million of payments. That's helpful. Thank you. Scott Gruber at Citigroup. Your line is open. Yes, good morning. Um, Doug, in your prepared remark, I, I believe you mentioned upside to service you know, revenue in addition to the uh, upside to, to order intake. Uh, you guys have been targeting, you know, one and a half billion of, of service inbound in, in 25. And I'm just curious, you know, whether you guys are uh, contemplating upside to that number as well. Thanks, Scott. Um, you know, obviously we'll be giving a bit more detail uh, with our Q4 on our Q4 call, but I would tell you, uh, as you were kind enough to ask the question, we are very proud of our subsea services business. We have high expectations of our subsea business, uh, so you should expect to see our subsea services business uh, continue to benefit uh, not only from the higher level project awards, which means a higher level of uh, installation activity, but we're also seeing customers focus more on inspection, maintenance, and repair, uh, really wanting to ensure optimized uptime of their producing assets, as well as our subsea well intervention services. And that's really about uh, ensuring the production because there may be some downhole issue that has occurred um, and our ability then to go out and um, help them intervene into the well in the most cost-effective way. So there's multiple drivers and a significant amount of optimism around our subsea services business. Got it. Um, and, and the margins for that business have, have, have typically been better. Um, you know, what's, what's the outlook for pricing and margins going forward then? I just imagine that there's, you know, more competition with, with in, you know, between installation and, and the maintenance and inspection, uh, just given that the, uh, you know, equipment award volume is, is going up and therefore the installation outlook is going up. Um, does that create competition, you know, for those uh, resources, you know, to do the inspection, maintenance, repair, to, such that you can get, you know, incremental pricing and margin? Um, well, first of all, Scott, remember this is an OEM model, so we, uh, you know, we service and maintain everything that we install. We have the world's largest install base, uh, and we benefit from that with this business. It's, it's only growing, as you know, based upon the award activity, you know, over the last couple of years uh, where we've had a substantial growth uh, relative to the market uh, that is then reflected in subsequent years into our subsea services business, but it's all an OEM business. Uh, look, um, you, you know I don't talk a lot about pricing. We, we work very closely with our clients. They want to ensure that we're getting, um, that we are very satisfied uh, with, uh, that we feel we're being treated appropriately and fairly uh, on an economic basis, and um, uh, you know, we're, we're very comfortable with that, yes. Great. I appreciate the call, Doug. Thank you. Sarab Pont with Bank of America. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, Doug. Good morning. Uh, Doug, a quick uh, follow-up on the flexibles uh, question earlier on. It's really good to see the traction third quarter. Can you talk to a little bit about the demand outlook for flexibles and maybe talk to your capacity, the industry's capacity to deliver on that demand? And the reason I'm asking that, Doug, for some context is because one of your large competitors has talked about being sold out through 2025. So I'm just trying to think how's the demand looking, how's the capacity looking, particularly at uh, FDI. Yeah, the just like in every part of our business, you know, we don't focus so much on uh, being sold out. We focus on developing technology that we can ensure a shorter delivery time or faster deliveries or higher throughput, if you will. So if we look at sub-C 2.0 broadly, sub-C 2.0 uh, reduces the time through our facility by 50%. Or in other words, we can put twice the capacity through our existing facility without 
spending additional capital. When you're still doing engineer to order or 1.0, which as you point out, the rest of the industry is doing, including inflexibles, um, you're kind of constrained by the size of your facility and hence being sold out or percent utilized. Um, what we're doing now is expanding the 2.0 offering, or the 2.0 methodology across our entire offering, including flexibles. So our approach is how can we uh, have a better product that's configured to order versus engineered to order that we can uh, have a higher cadence through our manufacturing facilities, uh, thus addressing the market's needs. Um, the other aspect I would point out is, you know, clearly we're focusing on our partners, our direct awards, um, our IEPCI projects, because again, as I pointed out earlier, that's really the secret ingredient to success of an IEPCI or an integrated project. So we do some prioritization, which is why when I was answering uh, one of your colleagues earlier, you know, I said, you know, we, we do do some prioritization, and we do tend to work on the high-end, high-quality, if you will, uh, portion of the flexibles market. There is some low, you know, there is a lower-end portion of the flexibles market as well, uh, which we certainly can participate in, uh, but that's not where we focus. That's more the commoditized end of the of the flexibles market. Okay, awesome, Doug. Thank you for that. And uh, just a, a quick follow-up because we get uh, this question a lot uh, from investors, so let me just ask you the way I get asked. Uh, two of your competitors recently formed a joint venture. Uh, how should we think about the potential impact of that joint venture on the overall market, the industry's capability to respond to what's going on, and how does it impact FDI in particular? Uh, how should investors think about that? So just to clarify, you're talking about the three sub C? Yes, I'm talking about yes, the one sub C joint venture. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant the three sub C companies that are coming together. Yes, sorry. yes, um, yes, absolutely. Yep, so, yep. You know, well, 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 look, I think, you know, first and foremost, it's clear validation of the strength of the market. You know, you wouldn't, three sub C companies wouldn't be coming together, um, you know, if they didn't see the strength in the market. Uh, going forward, so it's just a you know it's just a point of validation, um, but it's also a reshaping of the market, right? Um, so you yeah. know, we see both of these things as quite favorable to our company. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about you know bringing companies together. Is, you know, consolidation is one thing. Uh, you know, creating an integrated offering we feel is the better way to go about it. Investing in technology. Uh, doing things that are going to improve our clients' project returns, that's where they see the value, and that's, quite frankly, why we've seen and continue to see the level of direct awards to our company, uh, which is actually, you know, quite unprecedented in our industry or, I believe, any industry. So, look, you know, from our point of view, uh, we did our heavy lifting back in 2015, uh, believe it or not, that long ago, as when we started the no. journey. Uh, we 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 completed the merger on the 17th of January 2017, and look, I'll be very candid. It took years. It took years to get everything operating at the level it's operating at today. You know, bringing together two companies, let alone three companies, is it's a, it's it's not easy to do. Um, so we're really glad we did ours eight years ago. Uh, I can tell you that. And today, we're singularly focused on our clients and singularly focused on their success by delivering the world's very best subsea projects. Right, no, that's, that's good. Okay, Doug, thank you, I'll turn it back. Our last question will come from the line of Wakar Syed with, at ATB Capital Markets. Your line is open. Uh, th thank you for uh, taking my question. Um, First one, uh, Doug, uh, you know, you've given guidance uh, that over the next five quarters, inbound orders and subsidy could be around $11 billion. If you look back over the last three to four months, has that view been upgraded or has that view relatively remained unchanged, but the confidence in that outlook has increased? A uh, fair question. I would say it's been upgraded and the confidence has, an, has increased. 
Okay. Now, does that have any impact then on your 2025 uh, outlook for revenues in EBITDA? Absolutely not. Okay. Well, let, let, let me clarify. Just, let me yeah. clarify. Let, 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 let me clarify. Uh, maybe that was too too quick of an answer. Um, when you talk about the 25 billion target for 2025, you know clearly, as indicated in my script, we expect you know that will be we will be giving you an update on that on the Q4 guide. And so, if you were staying on inbound, as you mentioned, uh, EBITDA again, as I said earlier, um, you know we're going to be giving uh, a, uh, we just gave a view for total company. Uh, EBITDA for 2024, which is an increase again this quarter. It's the second consecutive quarter that we're increasing our 2024 uh, number, uh, which obviously shows a very strong pattern. Uh, we'll be segmenting that out on the fourth quarter call, and um, we may take the opportunity to revisit uh, 2025 as well, but clearly it's trending in the right direction. Okay. And then, uh, you know, in terms of your capital spending, uh, you know, $250 million or so for, for this year, is that number likely to change? I know it's still early for next year, or is that kind of a base level 250 that's likely to stay year over year? Um, you know, the, the truth is we don't know. Um, and I know it's an important number because I know it's a visible number for investors to use in their decision making. What I would encourage uh, people to realize is it's really the prioritization of that spend. And it's clearly being prioritized to upstream and it's clearly being prioritized to offshore. So from our perspective, we are very confident in the continued growth of the capital expenditure. And I'm going to let, ask Elf to add some additional no, additional. Comments. I just want to add the reminder that you, uh, so when you look at our capital expenditure, we have given uh, the long range guide, long term guidance that we are going to be in the range of three and a half to four and a half percent. However, you know, over the past 12 months and more, we have really seen that we can operate at that three and a half, you know, the lower end of that range, and that continues to be the guidance, meaning three and a half percent of revenue level. It's true for this year. It's probably going to be true for next year. And you just, you know, uh, keep that number for right now as, as, a, as a guide for, for, for the intermediate term. No, thank you, Elf. Uh, you know, I was answering it, just to be clear, I was answering it from, you know, our customers' capital expenditure. And oh. thank you for clarifying the internal, Elf. I appreciate it. All right. well, thank you very much. Appreciate the answers. I will now turn the call back over to Matt Seinsheimer for parting remarks. Thank you. This concludes our third quarter conference call. A replay of the call will be available on our website beginning at approximately 8 p.m. British summer time today. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact the investor relations team. Thank you for joining us. Jack, you may now end the call. This concludes today's conference call. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.